looks that gray out. Hey guys, if you're watching us, welcome to tonight's show, episode of Let's Talk with Shade and Ayo. Shade is about to join us in a moment. Right, I'm going to add her now. And yeah, she's going to be here right now. About shame. Why is shame such a big deal? Well, if you stay tuned, you're about to find out. Can you hear me? Hi there. Hi. How's it going? Hey, Shadi. <laughs> All right. Happy Friday. <laughs> yeah. Same to you. How's, All right. Um, how's the weather looking? Uh, I think it's hot. I haven't been outside yeah. since morning, so. Yeah. 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 It's, it's kind of warm here, too. I'm going to move this back just a little. Let's see. All right. Am I there we are. Please? I need to be close to you. <laughs> close to you. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm okay now. Great. So, talking about shame today. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's a huge, huge topic. We're not going to be able to do it all today. That's for sure. Yeah? We're not, we can't. I, I kind of went no. through my prep and I was like, yeah, this is, if you can, um, if you can eliminate shame, mm. you literally eliminate, I would say 50% of mental health problems. I kind of agree with you, especially as people from our cultural context. At least 50%, maybe even more. Yeah. I was talking to someone who is from this part of from Europe and I was asking him what he felt about the topic. And I could see how he struggled to understand why it would be something worth unpacking. <laughs> but it, 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 it reminds me that our experience of shame as Nigerians and Africans is different from how it's experienced by some other people. We, well, yeah, because ours is experienced as normal. We experience uh, shame as normal. Um, yeah. There are definitely shame-bound individuals in other cultures. Many of them, actually. Oh, yeah. I, for, different, I, I, for different reasons. That's it, the other thing again. You right. You feel it for the reasons we feel it. Uh, yeah, well, they call those things abusive situations. We call them normal. Hey. <laughs> oh, that's what it is. All right. Yeah. Yeah. The shame comes the same way, but we, we think that's normal. Like, hey, I should feel this shame. This yeah. shame is good for me. This shame is what's yeah. keeping me functional. Uh, yeah. This shame is what's making me a good moral person. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're way more shame bound uh, because we actually see it as being, as being good. And you also find similar, you find similar flavors of shame within uh, fundamentalist religious settings mm. because shame Jeez. is the tool. Shame okay. is the, shame is the tool. Shame is the, um, I don't want to say weapon because they don't see it as a weapon. You know, they see it as uh, the only way to tame the wild human being. Wow, that's what it is. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, the world will end. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when I was doing my research, I made notes. I wanted to tie shame to culture. So I made notes about things we do naturally in our culture, which we don't give a second thought. Just to, because I wanted to remind us of how much cultural or part of culture our experience of shame so i'm going to just rattle off but like basically an outline of shame i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to throw out some what i call shame languages how is my audio sounds good fine okay i'm going to yep. talk about i'm going to mention i'm going to list if you are watching this some shame languages things we say and they are unique to our culture so see if you remember this shame not to catch you <laughs> That's even or, a good way to put it. <laughs> okay, or ujutie. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You should be ashamed of yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, no for my hand, I beg. How does that make you feel? No for my hand, I beg. Or in my language, I don't you see me. I don't you see your money. Yeah. Yeah. Or 
what does the word it our uh, word for shame in my language is it is you we actually have a word and i think yeah there's humiliation more, there's, embarrassing there's more than, yeah, more than one word humiliation and embarrassment then, what is this thing in my language that's called people are shiri we use mm. it in prayer uh, in prayer and invocation what's, may my uh, shame be this? covered may my, may my shame uh, be covered may my embarrassment be covered yeah yes and, yeah. Yeah, and what kind of prayer is allah maje could you tell me <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, let me not and be I, ashamed yeah uh, hey. so i went back okay i want uh, I'll, sh i'll share a little but i went back into our into old yoruba history and i found out that look we have this thing in our ancient history about the calabash and when a king or an important person has done wrong and needs to be excommunicated you send him a calabash containing certain items there are no words hmm. in, in that message but once the king opens the calabash and sees the contents he get a he gets a message of extreme uh, shame and ostracization and the next right. thing he, do, he, he does is to go out of the out of the community <clears throat> and take his own life yeah so yeah. there's there's actually a fundamental link between shame ostracization depression yes. suicide yes yes which goes so, all the way from how we began to where we are now as a people right so i mean just to walk back the history a little bit uh, some of the elements of shame so Let's go back to yeah. caveman days because we didn't just we didn't just show up here when we began to you know, the the social there's a social element of uh, so survival yeah. of the, of the tribal survival right yeah. so say in caveman days we didn't have a bit, nice big houses we didn't have guns we didn't have we may not even have had knives at those points so, yeah. so it, the only way you can so, so for instance if you if you have a lion and it's chasing a herd if the herd turns around <laughs> against the lion you know they'll stampede it you'll notice mm -hmm. that lions or you know uh, animals of prey hesitate to attack a herd yeah. they don't just jump into a herd they okay. they'll wait until maybe there's a, a, a child that's separated from its mother or they'll yeah. look for the animal that's weak and sick sick or on the edges mm -hmm. of the herd So even animals of prey don't attack a whole herd. And so and that was All the right. nature of our adaptation in caveman days. You know, All we right. had to stay with the herd. We had to stay with the tribe to survive. Right. If you were a lone human being outside of your tribe, caught in the forest by yourself, and your yeah. tribe had packed up and moved on, you were finished. You know, you're finished. You, yeah. can't, you couldn't survive. And that was the reason why anything that caused you to be separated from the tribe basically means death. Right, right. And now, but however, you come, you know, thousands of years later, we don't live that way anymore. That biological, yeah. emotional, mental adaptation that says we must be a part of the herd. We must be a part of the tribe. We must be a part of our family. We must be a part of our community to survive that element is there now so for instance if you get kicked out of your family that's bad yeah. but it doesn't yeah. mean death anymore mm -hmm. right but those mm -hmm. elements of shame are still being used to say hey if you don't do this or if you cause yeah. me an inconvenience you're going yeah. to be separated from the tribe from us. so yeah. That, yeah. yeah and so what what happens is shame as defined now not as defined you know in our adaptation is When, you, when a child, because it, shame develops, this toxic shame that we're talking about, it develops yeah, yeah. in childhood within families, within social yeah. environments, yeah. is when a child has a need, right? Yeah. We talked about this last week, where a young man asked his father for pocket money and got whipped for the request, not even for stealing, yeah. but for the request. So that child yeah. has a need, and instead of that need being met, they are punished for having that need or they are yeah. ostracized for having that need, or they're punished, or they're given disgust from the parent or from the social tribe. They're given disgust, contempt. They're rejected yeah. for having that need. Yeah. Because you, we don't come up with our own needs. Our needs are just part of who we are. As human beings, I have a need for food. So now imagine if I'm hungry and I ask for food, and instead of getting food, I'm shamed, like Oliver Twist. Uh. What happens with that is that we become ashamed of needing others because that shame, uh, that need causes us to be humiliated, embarrassed, or rejected. But we can't help but have needs. 
See, can you see the double bind? You have a need, but that need puts you in a situation where you are then rejected, which, is, which, which it spells to your brain that you're about to die. So shame evolved from an evolutionary need to protect us when, when we were community-bound. And now that we're advancing away from communities, it's less necessary in the survival instinct way that it was. Right. So shame is now, is a, shame is a tool that was necessary. Well, it was, and even then it wasn't necessary, but it was, it developed out of that necessity. Let me put it that way. It developed out of that necessity that not being a part of this community means death. Right. You know, but what, what I'm trying to say is that it, it, not being rejected by our tribe feels like death to us. Right. Yeah. Just biologically. And that's, that's actually yeah. not by itself. That's not bad. What happens yeah. that's dysfunctional and abusive is when your family uses that emotion yeah. to control you. Yeah. See what I'm saying? So feeling the need to be connected to our families is not a bad thing by itself. But what's but, bad, what creates shame is when your family uses that need that you have to be connected to them as a way of controlling you. And preventing so, you from, from being an individual. And, and preventing you from being them. an individual, preventing you from yeah. inconveniencing them, preventing you from annoying them. So you can be something and as put, long... And putting their need for image and reputation above your need. Exactly. For Using that need for connection as a tool to make sure you make them look good. See, it if you like don't... Herod has, has questions. Please, if you, ask questions, if you have questions, Herod, please put them and we'll answer you. If you don't, um, if you don't do what I say, uh -huh. you're going to be separated from the tribe. Right. So it's I, like it, a punishment. It, it's a punishment. punishment. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a punishment. But what happens when... So it, it, it's hard to explain it, but let me give you an, let me give you an example. When a child... Um, uh, oh, here's... Here's, here's an example. Um, you have a child who loves, you know, they love their mother, loves the mother so ah. much, right? You love, I mean, every, and every child loves their mother, right? Um, they're three years old or whatever, two years old. Their mother comes home from work, right? And the child yeah. is three years old, is in the crib and is in bed, right? So the mother yeah. comes from work, she's tired, doesn't want to see the kid, the nanny has already put the kid into bed. The child has been missing the mom all day, right? So climbs out of bed, runs downstairs to hug the mother. What does that child need in that moment? That child needs that connection, needs to be hugged, needs to be loved. Like, hey, I love you. I know you've been missing me all day, right? Yeah. But the mother, for her own needs, see, and, and, and I never want to say that any parent does these things out of malice. They do it out of their own trauma, out of their own. And this is what those of us that are recovering from trauma need to remember. It was never about you. <laughs> if there had been a different child in that situation, that child would have gotten the same treatment. It was never about mm. who you were. The okay. child runs to the mother and then the mother's face changes. What's wrong with you? You should be in your bed by now, you know, or smacks the child or spanks the child or disciplines the child to get the child to conform with what she wants in that moment without a uh, awareness of what the child needed. What happens with that child is that need for connection that they were being driven by was met with rejection. And to prevent that rejection in future, the mm -hmm. feeling of shame arises every time that child feels that need for connection. Wow. So it's, like, it's almost like what I like to call socially communicable not diseases, but <laughs> the yeah. things that we affect each other with through behavior. Yeah, through. yeah, basically. Can I, yeah. Can I read to you a little text? How, someone said exactly what you're saying about the relationship between parents and children and how that provokes shame. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. So this person says, here's how shame happens. He says, every parent loves their child. Partly because the child is a kind of extension of self for the parent. Huh. Um. In a bid to protect your child whom you love, when a, child needs, when a child misbehaves and needs to be disciplined, a parent may use language or methods to pull the child back into a safe place. But these yep. methods are often closely related to the ones that that parent learned from their own parents. Mm -hmm. and which, uh, so if a parent has inherited, for instance, a harsh, negative, or self-negative voice mm -hmm. from their own parents, when the child is in that uh, uh, difficult spot, they will repeat the same message. 
blurt it out unconsciously to the child. Right. And when a parent is stressed or anxious towards their child, who is an extension of themselves, uh, they, they use their verbal force, maybe through yelling and all of that, to control the child and pull them into what they think should be a safe place. Like you said earlier, reenacting their own childhood and make sure that the child doesn't get out of the community and get harmed. So they are doing it in love. Mm -hmm. But it has a very different uh, effect on the child. So what happens in the child's mind? I'm going to read here from uh, another friend, Mariel. The child internalizes the issue as being my fault. I must yeah. be doing something wrong that daddy and mommy don't like. Hey, Ariola, thank you for joining us. Then the child starts to believe that there are things he or she is doing and will continue to do that will lead again to this trauma that he feels now. Right. Then the child starts thinking, how can I avoid feeling this thing I'm feeling now? And then the child starts to feel, think of him, his or herself as a flawed human. Mm -hmm. and, their, and then their sense of self-worth gets disrupted. This whole cycle right. from parents into the child is called the shame response. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very true. Um, and then it, it, I guess it, one, one way to look at it is also like if you, you to recognize that shame, you know, when yourself as an adult, because sometimes we don't, when we look back, we look at where our parents were just disciplining us. You know, yeah. it, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Right. It yeah. wasn't that bad. It wasn't such a big deal. Sometimes think about how you think about yourself. What's your, what does your self concept look like? What is your self-concept? When you make a mistake, how do you feel? Do you go into a shame spiral when you make a mistake at work? Do you feel yeah. unnecessarily exposed or vulnerable when you do something wrong? Or wait, no, let me say something wrong. You know, something like that. There, there's, a, there's a quote that I have from, I think it was, um, I don't know if it was Pete Walker. He said, um, oh no, it was another book, but I can't remember the name right now. What exactly have you done that you feel so bad about yourself? Did you kill someone's child? Did you rob a bank? <laughs> you know, yeah. there's some of us that feel so bad about who we are. We come down yeah. so hard on ourselves based on tiny mistakes that we make. And it comes from that um, installation of shame as a child when you hear things like, I'll really give you something to, to cry about. Or when parents have an excessively negative um, response to small mistakes, the child spills the milk. You know, and the mother and father start get up and start yelling, what's wrong with you? How can you, speak? you know, that kind of a thing. The child feels like there's something wrong with them. There's that thing that starts playing, like you said, there's something wrong with them, there's something wrong with them, there's something wrong with them. And then in adulthood, little mistakes become uh, huge instances of just self-loathing. Yes, and then there's, a, there's, a, there's an inability to move forward. There's an inability to take risks because of the fear of exposure the fear of shame, the fear of making a mistake, the fear of failure. So what happens to us when shame becomes the reason for making or not making decisions? Oh, <laughs> extreme, you're extremely limited. Extremely, mm. you're extremely limited in what you can do. Like the ability to fulfill your potential is just, yeah. it's not there, you know? Um, yeah. I remember times that I felt, I, it's funny, my own shame spirals generally happen some of them, when I do something good, when, I, when something great and awesome happens, I, yeah. So you're ashamed if you are doing well, and I say, ah, Shadi, that was good, and you're like, oh, no, it's not so good. It's not yeah, good. that's even a mild, I don't even know how to describe, <laughs> okay. how to describe the feeling. I, like, sometimes yeah. when I, like, I, I, I won an award at, one, at work once, and I just felt so, I almost had a panic attack, and I drove straight to my therapist's office. <laughs> So from work. The, the fact that everybody was focused on you and said, yes. you made you. Yes, it was horrible. I was like, so that was the day when I was like, yeah. there's something wrong here. This is not normal. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, this is not normal. I shouldn't feel ashamed of winning an award at work. <laughs> okay, how about the challenge that people sometimes tend to shame us for things we have no control over? Maybe things that are integral to our body or the way we are constructed. Let me give you an example from my childhood. There's a Yoruba word that you used to describe so who is perceived to be losing weight. Mm -hmm. The word is called, it's called uru. You know, mm -hmm. How do I say uru? It's very common. You just be walking around, one neighbor, one relative, see, ah, ah, you're well, who told you meta? 
So there's a lot of focus on um um how you say that on body image. Body image, yeah. We, we we know by now that body image is very central to identity and it's a very easy way to damage someone's self-esteem. Yeah. I'm saying this because as a child who hadn't yet developed such complex vocabulary, the word ru and the way it was spoken venomously sounded in my ears like the other Yoruba word room, which means smell. Smell. Mm -hmm. And my brain, my brain could not separate between the impact of someone telling me that I was losing weight and someone telling me that I'm stinking. So with that word, I acquired the shame of, of as if I was stinking and being rejected every time someone said, dirty rule. And it was my stature. I was not a fat <laughs> child. So we can imagine how often I had to deal with this. And hey, I already say it's helpful. Imagine how often I as a child had to deal with... Um, with shame, because there was always someone willing to comment on what my body looked like, even though he right. thought I was just being my normal self. Right. I think, well, I mean, and I agree with that, but I think people are going to make, so people, some, some people, I think the shame element, so for instance, I got the same comments um, about my stature, but my family, here's the interesting thing, my family was never focused on my weight, whether I was thin or fat or whatever, they, my, my, my core, my nuclear family never focused on it. So when other people commented on it, it never impacted me as much. So then when I went to school, people made fun of me for being thin. They called me mosquito, lanky, blah, blah, blah. That never impacted me much. And I'm, I'm saying that to underscore the, the importance of the nuclear family in installing shame. It's mostly installed through trauma right. oh, yeah. um, in childhood. And it's mostly oh, yeah. installed by the family. So you'll find out the things that shame you the most are the things that your family members shamed you with, especially your parents. Because when you were a child, you felt like your survival depended on your parents. So anything that brought a look of disgust from your parents, that brought a look of contempt, that brought an action or words of rejection from your parents, is likely to be what will shame you in future or what will be installed as a shame trigger into adulthood. Not so much what other people, what other people say. But people who are, who are close to you. Who are people who are close to you. So yeah, so maybe not necessarily yeah. family, but people who are clo in that close community because that's the community you're afraid of being rejected from. So achievement, in my family, we were very achievement-based, right? And so what caused the issue for me was my parents uh, were very achievement-based. So achievement was very um, important to them. So I was like, it's going to be an achiever, right? So for me, achievement was easy. But what happened was after the divorce and my father remarried, my stepmother at always attacked my achievements because of her issues. <laughs> oh, yeah. So oh, that yeah. really caused like a weird hey, bit of craziness in my own brain in another family yeah. you could, or another child in this in a similar family might be so you have one sibling who's an achiever in a family where yeah. achievement is important and you're not an achiever at least in the way that they measure oh, it yeah. a child could be artistic versus academic and then gets shamed for not bringing home a's and b's so yeah. People can be shamed for the opposite things. It's like so weird. Some people can be shamed in their nuclear family for being thin. Others may be shamed for being fat. So the, the yeah, thin person yeah. wonders why the fat person has a problem with you. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you a practical question with what you said now. But before I ask it, I want to, I want to acknowledge our, our guest. Fatty says it's the people closest to you that mold or build your shame meter. That is exactly so, right. Yeah. You said that a child comes home with a certain grade and then he's shamed for the grade. Mm -hmm. By comparing to the other child, does he have two heads? Eh? Okay. Right. Let me. Uh, so my question is, does shaming that child who has lower grades, does it, what does, what's the result? Does it help the child to go work harder and get better grades? Or does it make the child actually withdraw and become less capable of being their best self academically? It, it just depends. See, that's the thing. The, the, actual, yeah. the actual result at that moment is not as much, yeah. it's not as important as mm -hmm. the long-term shame. So you could have a child who was shamed into getting good grades. So the parents mm -hmm. shamed Does you, they got you a tutor. Oh, of course. Can shame, let's be frank, Charlie, let's think about it. Is shame the ingredient for academic success? Are there better ways of getting a child to do better in school? Apart yeah. From so they, I'll give you an example of a family that I know, you know, so these are mm -hmm. some of my extended yeah. relatives. You had the firstborn son who was more academic you know, okay. more academically inclined, right? Yeah. Easy to get A's through secondary school, blah, blah, blah. 
you had, and he actually then ended up winning awards, was on TV. But yeah. the second son, not so academic, which is actually normal for birth order things, right? But through his secondary school, his father would whip him so that he would get good grades. So he got the grades, um, went through secondary school, Wait, went wait, through wait. university, got decent right. grades, right? But they would never, once he, once he had finished the compulsory uh, education, would never take a risk. He never took a risk in life. He got one job oh, yeah. until today. Will never, yeah. will not leave that job. Will not, it's, it doesn't make sense. So in a family where I there's a, see, yeah. the ability to take a so risk the, is so the temporary painful. Results. The temporary result was achieved in getting him to get a certain grade, but the long-term yes. result was a crippled person who had no um, audacity. Right. No I ability mean, to start a business. Go, yeah. No ability to... He was encouraged to leave the country to no. get a master's degree, too scared to yeah. do it. Yeah. Exactly. I, I'm going to pick up on that point, and I'm going to turn it into an example to say what my mother did with me academically. And the person, my purpose of saying this is to help people to in a practical sense, to break the cycle of shame and to find alternative ways of dealing with children instead of using shame to propel them. Like we said originally, mm -hmm. parents use shame because they love you. And in their own minds, shaming you is their way of getting you to sit up. Let me tell you what my mother did with me. Mm -hmm. And why it's important what you said about a child who now no longer has the audacity to be his best self. When I was in uh, primary three or four, I was probably like eight years old. My standard score in mathematics was zero. 0 over 10, 0 over 14, with two eyes and a nose and a mouth. My teacher had a name for me. His name was, uh, okay, I had two teachers. The first one called me Mr. Careless. The second one called me, I can't remember what he called me. I almost got a cap on my head. Sitting so basically you were what they called Olodo. Yeah. You were an Olodo. Oshe, Olodo Rabat and all that. So they called my, yeah, they called my mother to school, say, look at your son. Olodo, Olodo, Lomoni, and so and so. So I, that was me at eight. By the time I was like 14 and I was leaving secondary school i had nine straight a's including an a1 in mathematics and i'm going to say this not not as i'm just saying so you can see the story when i when i did my work mathematics the exam if you get 90 minutes for your written paper i think i worked out 90 minutes that's one and a half hours i think i worked out in about a little over 10 minutes i'm serious i'm not joking i went to that exam well, boom my head was in with smoke and i worked out and I, was, <laughs> I got an a an a1 let me tell you how I did it between the age of eight and the age of 14. And what also, and that, what that has to do with shame. Instead of my mom saying, oh, Ramon, but what are you? Do they have two heads? What she did was, first of all, she sent me to, she said, ah, your teacher says you are a dunce, but I know there's something inside you that is good. You know what I'm going to do? She got me lesson teacher. Some of them will come to the house and they will start teaching me. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, she started sending me to all the best lessons in the neighborhood. And these were very expensive, but they, were, they had a reputation as being very good. So mommy sent me to all of them. So that was her own contribution. So when I saw her energy and her focus and what she wanted me to do with my time, it inspired me also to make personal choices. So what right. I did was, in my, in my long holidays, when all the other kids were outdoors playing football, I personally decided to lock myself up in the little uh, pantry or store, as we used to call it, very small room. I sat with a desk, a very poor wooden desk, and I stacked my textbooks, New German Mathematics, four, five, and six there. And I said to myself, this thing is not making sense in school, but I'm going to make sure it makes sense to me. And I began to study those books. And I did that for a couple of months. And by the time I was done, I'd internalized this so-called difficult subject. And that's how I got those grades. So I'm, I'm using this example to say that there are two ways to, in that example, to, to react to a child who is not doing well in school. And parents mm -hmm. should like their parent now. Do you want to shame the child into success and then let's get the child who later is so crippled that he cannot make excellent independent choices? Or do you want to right. my mom did and say, I will help you. I will give you better teachers, extra coaching. I'll spend money on you and I'll motivate you so that you take upon yourself the task of study and see what right. the results are. Whatever those results were then, they have become sustainable until today. I still make good choices when it comes to academic and professional uh, excellence. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's, I guess... I would say that's a huge topic that requires its own, its own day because I don't yeah. want to just be prescriptive. Like, okay, everybody whose yeah. child isn't doing well in school, go put them in lesson. There's, there's really no formula. Yeah. Really, The real formula goes back to empathy. For the parents okay. to have the ability in that moment to put themselves in their child's shoes, 
if you can remember what it felt like to be that child. And a lot of us yeah. have locked that part of ourselves away because of our own, <laughs> everything that we went through, you know, and we're just repeating the cycle unconsciously. What really helps is to look at your child, take, just take a, take a deep breath in that moment. Don't just react and try to remember what it was like to be your child in that moment. Or try to imagine, if you can, if you were a different child, try to imagine what your child is feeling in that moment and ask yourself, what does my child really need in this moment? There are certain fundamental needs that mm, all human beings okay. have. They have, a, 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 they have a, a need to be loved. So whatever your action is going to be, it needs to be like, I need to make sure my child knows he or she is loved, whatever is so happening. You're saying that if a parent does not center themselves in the child's moment and allows the child to be the center, and does not center issues like image and reputation and how they personally... They'll know what the child let, needs. They'll be able to speak without shame and all that. They will be able to know what the child needs. Because some children, for some children, sending them to the wrong lesson is what will install the shame. See what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. If, if all of the siblings did, are not going to lesson and you send the child yeah. to the lesson yeah. with a message yeah. of rejection, that can install the shame. So I don't want to just prescribe that. It's, it's saying, what does my child need to feel loved? My child needs to feel safe. Yeah. Right. So whatever you do needs to include a feeling of safety. My child needs to feel like my child needs to retain their self-identity and their self-esteem. Whatever I do, it must not destroy my child's confidence. However yeah. you do it. See what I'm saying? So you have to take all those elements of love yeah. and safety and empathy and then make a decision. Yeah. For some people, it's sending the child to lesson. For some people, it's keeping the child at home. For some people, it's taking the child out of the school. If the school is a toxic environment, Precisely. Those so there's so many elements. And yeah. I'm telling you, all children are different. Like, well, it, I have to... Identifying, maybe identifying the child's peculiar academic... Uh, right. Might not be the kind of mathematics or geography child. Might be right. Be teacher, government, commerce. I don't know what if what the is. child is dyslexic? If you, if you can't even take exactly. the time to even figure out that uh, the child is dyslexic, it doesn't matter where yeah. you send them. So there's an element yeah. of, like, it's, it's coming down to, I don't want to pass on a, a message of shame. I don't want to make yeah. my child feel unloved or de de rejected in this moment, even as we yeah. resolve, resolve this problem. Yeah. Yeah, those are great answers um, and questions too. Um, I think we should begin to round up our, our guests. Uh, but while we're here, should we, should we round up with questions? And I don't know. How, well, how if, there, we can... if, if, there, if there are questions, and, and I guess we can, we can take questions, if there are any questions. We can also talk about how to, because my, my clients are adults. I really, I don't, yeah. I don't work with children so much, um, but with adults yeah. who, are, who are living with toxic shame currently. Okay. Yeah. Where toxic yeah. shame is preventing you from moving forward. It's preventing you from making friends. Uh, it's preventing you from having a social life. So like what are some things, I would like to talk about what are some things an adult can do if they experience feelings of shame that prevents them from doing yeah. things they know they would like to do. One, I'd like to okay. do what, and I don't, they, I'm sure there are all kinds of technical words for it, but it's really like rewriting memories. Rewriting a memory that installed shame right. in your life. So we all know those, we all know those moments where we were completely humiliated and embarrassed by whoever, yeah. wherever, right? And if you can walk yourself back, um, and, the, you know, this is basically... A lot of times people need to do this with a therapist, uh, but often if you are, especially if you're functioning. So life coaching, I work with people who are functioning. If a person is suicidal or, you know, I don't work with those people, they need therapy. But if a person is basically functional, like you and I, we have jobs, we have kids, we have families, you know, <laughs> we're generally okay. But you want to deal with those feelings of shame. Rewriting a memory, a shameful memory is a good way of, is a good way of doing it. So um, I have one, uh, it's, it's helpful to take that memory when you were a kid or a, a teenager and whoever shamed you, what they were saying to you, think of yourself, your current self or another adult that you respected and loved walking into that situation and telling you what you really needed to hear in that moment. And just use your imagination to rewrite that movie into a movie that had a different ending where someone came in and, and, and said the right thing. Hmm. So an example would be, um, 
say you came home uh, with your five A's and a B, right? <laughs> to your parents. And the typical African parent is going to yell at you for not getting all A's. And it's going to shame you for another, another kid having gotten all, all A's and you didn't, you know? And so depending on the level of, you know, impact that that had on you, but I'm just giving an example. So say you walked in, your father, what's wrong with you? I never got a B in my life. I always had all A's. How dare you get a B? Blah, blah. <laughs> now, as you re re replay that memory in your mind, maybe your yeah. mom was the one that was, or you had a mentor, or you can even just see yourself now walking in. So just close your eyes, think of yourself walking in and saying, hey, sir, that's not the appropriate response. This child, see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you insert a new actor into the You memory. insert a new actor into the memory that gives you an right. empathetic and compassionate result. Because compassion is the answer to shame. Because what we needed in those moments... the answer to shame. Yeah, what we needed in those moments of being shamed was compassion, was love and safety, as someone who understood what we're going through. So if you can insert a right. compassionate adult in that memory, it starts to release those feelings of shame. And, and that so when, actually affect the rest of your life course and heal yes, you. Yes, that simple technique, that simple technique wow. can change so much. Can change so much because wow. the, whenever you, you get triggered to feel shame again, you'll feel less, especially the more you practice Instant. that, you'll feel less and less yeah. shame until you start to cross yeah. over into confidence and peace. Which is, oh, peace wow. is the word I use. Peace is the word I yeah. use for it. Like when I've overcome shame, what's yeah. replaced it has been peace. Like I'm okay with myself. I'm okay. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm just human. Wow, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing. I guess it's all about, I feel what you said now makes me feel like someone who transitions from a place of shading and darkness into light. By doing the work of, of replacing the memory with something more pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. Fatih says she's on learning yeah. this with her yeah. kids now. <laughs> and she has the pressure of being a gifted child and therefore she really has to <laughs> a child that doesn't like reading books. Projecting her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing Fatih. Good work. Well done. Well done. Well done. Yeah. yeah. No, it's it's we have to see ourselves. We have to separate ourselves, have a boundary between who I am and who my kid is. You are not your child. You know that thing yeah. I read about parents. <laughs> the child is the extension of you. Not true. Not true. The child exactly. is exactly <laughs> exactly exactly that's actually a right, self-absorbed way of looking at things but this has been awesome oh, i think yeah. so really, we have to do shame again it's yeah. really dear to my heart i encounter it all the time yeah. with my clients over so oh, yeah, many yeah. things and it's it's amazing yeah. to see them blossom once they get a hold of that yeah 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 that feeling i know that feeling now and then and it's always beautiful to just yes yes like this self and to do more oh. and to stop restricting myself based on the pattern of shame and anxiety and all of that that's why we're here yes yeah. all right so this was awesome um i don't see any questions um what well, it says 12 comments how come i only see four they're probably down there somewhere for instance what is commented on this is on the screen now yeah, I see hers. I don't see any others. Do you see any questions before we before we go? I, Fatis, yeah, I don't see any questions right now except Fatis comment. But we're gonna we're gonna scroll through our questions after this and deal with them. If you guys have questions, keep dropping them. Go check our YouTube page out. Yes, I'm so excited about button. the YouTube. Subscribe, subscribe all, to the YouTube. All five episodes are on YouTube right now. Yeah. Fatih says, I know I'm not my kid and my kid is not me. Great mantra. Well done, Fatih. That's what we're you're doing. awesome, Fatih. <laughs> like you're breaking the cycle. You're breaking the cycle. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's hard work, but you know what? Somebody's got to do yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Shadi, thanks for taking the time. Thank you. See you Tuesday. Tuesday. All right, then. Bye. Bye, guys.